Hi everyone, Jenny Morton here and very glad to be with you for this talk where we're going to talk about uh, digestive health, how it relates to emotional health and how it relates to performance. Um, so digestive issues are a common experience for, for performing artists. Um, we're going to be looking at the, the relationship between stress and the digestive system and why um, it, it does predispose us if we're in a stressful state a lot of the time, why it predisposes uh, digestive issues. Um, but also looking at the context of the performer um, because they, they spend a lot of their time in a hyperadrenal state, right? Just being in performance. So you wouldn't necessarily categorize that as emotional stress in the, the sense of anxiety, although a lot of performers do have performance anxiety, which be related to that. Um, but actually just that sort of uh, being switched on, you know, I always say, um, the sympathetic nervous system, which as we're going to see is the, the mechanism that um, uh, is underneath the anxiety response, is simply a system of mobilization, right? It's there to just make us get up in the morning and go out to work or to the shops or whatever we need to do. Um, so if we're simply getting mobilized to be in performance, we, we tend to be sort of up the sympathetic dominant end of our um, nervous system state. Um, so just by the very definition that that's what they do for a living um, uh, every day, then they're spending a lot of time in that adrenal state and that can also have a depleting effect on the digestive system over time. So anyone, even an artist who is not specifically sort of experiencing anxiety in their life and actually is very happy going on stage at night and really enjoys it, um, there's still an element of this um, adrenal state that can be uh, factoring into uh, the the expression of digestive problems. So let me bring up my slides here. Um, we'll make that full screen. Um, so, oh, that's not moving on. Oh, it's gone too far. There we go. So. This idea of the adrenal performance state um, is still, as I said, as a, an activation of the sympathetic system. So um, you may be familiar with Dr. Hans Selye, um, who was basically the guy who coined the term stress in terms of the, of the human behavioral experience. So he was doing research in the sort of 30s, 40s, um, and he's known as the father of stress um, because he was looking at the biological um, experience of um, stress. Uh, he was looking primarily in sort of rats and mice, he did a lot, a lot of his experiments. Uh, but he really described um, the whole um, stress mechanism in the body, something called general adaptation syndrome, which still stands today. Um, but what he also showed was that there are two types of stress. So when we're talking about, oh, I'm stressed, we're typically talking about distress, right? This, uh, which is the destructive uh, version of the stress state. But he also described a state called eustress. So that's the same uh, uh, beginning of the word as euphoria, right? So this euphoria, eustress state is just a state of joy, right? Um, and, I, you know, I often say to people, I, I do a lot of anxiety management work with people, and they, they'll often come to me and say, oh, I want you to get rid of my anxiety. I'm like, no, you don't because if I get rid of your anxiety, we're also get rid of, getting rid of your capacity for joy, right? Because if you think about it, if you're like excited to see someone that um, you haven't seen for a long time, like your best friend of years and they've been away and, and uh, suddenly you're gonna see them again, you get excited, right? You get, your heart rate goes up, you maybe get butterflies in your stomach, you, you might get a little tense in your shoulders. It's the same uh, symptoms, if you like, of distress as well. So physiologically, the body doesn't really discriminate between, um, you know, destructive stress 
and the stress of joy. And I would often relate that, the eustress thing, to um, the experience of performance for a lot of artists, those who are not troubled by performance anxiety. I didn't really suffer from performance anxiety, but you get that kind of performance high, right? Well, that's an adrenal state, that's eustress. Um, so it still can have a depleting effect on the body, but there aren't so many of the um, sort of stress chemicals that are produced with um, the distress uh, version. So it's, it's not as destructive on the body um, in terms of inflammatory rates and things like that. It's, it's more energy, it will deplete the energy in the same way, but it won't have so much of the destructive um, effect that we're talking about. But it will still affect the digestive system, which is obviously the focus of what we're talking about today. So you can see in that graph there, this sort of um, experience of, you know, eustress versus distress. So the eustress is an energized state, right? And you can be focused and on your game. Whereas the distress, you're going to get more of this sort of exhaustion, this depletion and health effects um, in that uh, bracket. So when we're looking at the performance state, um, you know, if you think of dancers or Broadway performers or something like that, you know, you, you can often see, well, yeah, you can see it's like high energy. They're doing a lot. There's, um, they're, they're going to be driving up into that sympathetic state uh, a lot more, but people are not always so familiar with what's going on with musicians. And this is a, a, a good study uh, that looked at heart rate in musicians during playing. And it showed that the heart rate is really, really spiking um, in, um, in artists when they are performing. Um, and they, their conclusions were that 50% of this increased heart rate response was associated with BMI, um, but also the tempo of the music and instrument type. So we know, you know, in all the literature of, of um, uh, the various instruments that are being played, there are some that are ergonomically more risky than others, but there are also instruments that um, uh, will uh, predict your rate of heart, uh, your increase in heart rate as well. Sometimes that may be mechanical for some of the, the brass instruments where you're having to create a lot of pressure in the body. Um, but also it's often more about instruments that uh, where you are a soloist. So if you think of, of a piano, right, a pianist, if you're a string player in an orchestra, you're, you're often just kind of buried, unless you are the soloist for that performance, you're quite buried in the, in, you're not so exposed. If you are a pianist, you are kind of by definition always a soloist, right? Even if you're playing with an orchestra, you are the soloist. So that's going to be perhaps more stressful than if you're, um, you know, second viola. Um, so this is uh, another study that, that looked at these um, heart rates and you can see, you know, if you look at the piano, for instance, the table on the left is comparing rehearsal versus performance. So there's an interesting correlation there. Um, and uh, you, if you see the piano, <laughs> they're always going to be a little bit more up there. Although actually some of the other instruments uh, were quite high in that. But again, it's going to depend on the repertoire that, that you're doing, because if it's something that's very high paced and very, say, the, the wind instruments are carrying a lot of the dominant line in it, then the wind players are going to have a higher heart rate than in another piece where they're just playing a very, um, you know, kind of lower level accompaniment, perhaps. Um, but if you look at the table bottom right and look at the classification of beats per minute in terms of what is just mild work and what is very heavy work, you can see that particularly the piano, but really um, uh, many of the instruments in this kind of top right table, maximum heart rate is getting up into that extremely heavy work bracket. You know, and I always say to musicians, you know, do you consider yourself an athlete? And they kind of look at me like I'm nuts, you know, it's like I'm just sitting in a chair playing. What's athletic about that? You see where the heart rate's going. You need to be fit right, to do this job. So we can see how they're going to be in this heart, high heart rate, which means sympathetic dominant state, just sitting in the orchestra playing playing their instrument. So it's not just the dancers and the, and the, the obvious, um, you know, kind of performance 
genres that you think well yes of course they're going to be in a in a sympathetic dominant state our musicians are very much so as well so just to kind of put a little bit of the architecture around what we're looking at here so we're looking at the digestive system but we're, we're looking at the context in which the digestive system is operating and the biological context um, is what I'm referring to. So this is going to be driven by the autonomic nervous system. So this is the body's autopilot, the um, non-conscious part of our nervous system that's operating without us kind of voluntarily overriding it. And this is divided into the sympathetic branch and the parasympathetic branch so the sympathetic branch as we know is known as the fight or flight state and at the extreme end of that is our anxiety response but i always like to underline particularly when i'm working with people with anxiety if you think of this autonomic nervous system as being a spectrum and at the bottom end you've got your parasympathetic completely chilled out bliss state and, and sleep state and then we can come all the way through the spectrum of just being a little more relaxed, but still kind of chilled. And then we're getting kind of, I'm just alert. And then I'm getting right. I'm getting up and go and I'm mobilized and I'm motivated. And now I'm like, Ooh, I'm a little unsure of what's going on. And now I'm in full panic. Right. So it's a spectrum and it's an elastic state that changes with every breath we take. So it's not an all or nothing system. Um, so we're looking at not again, when people say, get rid of my anxiety, you know, if we get rid of anxiety, you're never going to get out of bed in the morning. You have no motivation no mobilization in the system. So seeing it as this spectrum. And then of course the parasympathetic nervous system is known as the rest and digest system, which is obviously going to be key to what we're talking about today. And it's also where growth and repair happen as well. So if you know, you've been in a high performance state, um, and you've got some micro damage to your muscles or whatever from that performance, you need to be coming back down into that parasympathetic state, particularly sleeping well. And we know people with anxiety often have sleep issues as well. Um, but we need to be coming back down into that parasympathetic state to, to repair any damage. So again, this also plays into injury risk, which I was kind of talking about a bit more in my other talk. So let's just look at our digestive system and, and uh, what and where it is and what is considered because people often think, oh, straight away, they just think of the gut. Right. But we have to think of the whole digestive tract, which begins at the mouth, goes right down the esophagus, down into the stomach and then the whole uh, um, small intestine, large intestine, down to the, the rectum and, and then out the other end. So this is um, a hollow tube and it's about 30 feet of it packed into our body. Um, so one of the things I always say that, that kind of people don't often think of it in these terms, but the digestive system is, is, is a tube, right? We are actually built around a hollow tube. So in the middle of us is a hollow tube from one end to the other that is technically considered the external environment, right? So anything that's in that tube until it has passed through the walls of the gut lining and been absorbed into our system is still considered the outside, right? And anything in it is considered potentially a threat. Um, and therefore, the lining of the digestive tract is um, part of the immune system, right? It is the gatekeeper of, of allowing what it believes is useful to us in and keeping out what it thinks it may be detrimental uh, to us. So we have to think of the, the lining of the gut as, as being very much a part of the um, defense system. So when we're in a sympathetic state so when we're getting up that end of the um, autonomic nervous system uh, spectrum these are some of the things that are occurring heart rate and the blood pressure is going to go up right because remember we're preparing ourselves for some kind of mortal attack muscles are going to tense pupils dilate the immune system is being suppressed so essentially when we're in sympathetic dominant state and particularly when we're getting up the anxiety end of it the body is anticipating some kind of physical and potentially mortal attack on the body and that's what it's preparing itself for it requires a lot of energy to do that and there are many things in the body that that 
take a lot of the body's energy. I, when I'm talking to patients about this, I always say it's like we have a battery life, right? And there are certain applications in our body that drain the battery life more than others. The immune system is one, the digestive system is another. So when we go into this sympathetic state, then we are... Um, we need more energy. So the body switches off all non-essential activities um, so that it can divert the, that energy to fighting the, the predator. So digestion is going to be switched off. I would say, um, you know, the body doesn't really care if you digested lunch, if you're about to become lunch for uh, somebody else. Um, so your gastric secretion, saliva, the mucus that's produced. So remember, digestion begins the moment you put food in the mouth. So as soon as the food's in the mouth, the saliva there is starting to already break down um, the, the, the food. And that's why, you know, people who don't chew their food um, adequately are missing out a part of the digestive process and they're throwing down uh, food particles that are not ready for the gut. I always say, you know, the, the gut is um, designed from mouth to tail to be a sequential system. And if we skip a step, we're going to cause trouble further down the chain. So the saliva in the mouth is very important. So that's why when people are anxious and nervous, they get a dry mouth, right? Saliva is switched off. Um, so that can be an issue for particularly for our singers and also woodwind and brass players who need moisture. They need their mucous membranes to be, to be um, hydrated. And when you go into sympathetic mode, you're gonna get constriction of all of that. And and that's going to affect um, anybody who's using, you know, particularly vocal performance. Um, inflammation is increased. And this is a big one because we're going to be talking a lot about the inflammatory response in the gut. So just by the fact that we're in sympathetic mode, our inflammation has gone up. Breath's going to get high and shallow. And as we're going to see, that also has an effect on digestion. And then we're getting a lot of sugar released into the bloodstream right so that we've got instant energy to run and fight the tiger but if you're just sitting in your bedroom stressing about the audition you've got tomorrow or the concert you're doing next week and you don't feel prepared for it you've got sugar in the system that is not being used because you're not actually doing the exercise that is anticipated uh, by the body and we know that sugar is highly corrosive and inflammatory to a lot of our our um, uh, vessels and organs so this is not a state we want to be hanging out in for any period of time so let's look at what's happening specifically to digestion when we're in this anxiety response so that heart rate's gone up so digestion is like, right, you're being switched off, as we've talked about, saliva, gastric juices, all the mucosal secretions are all switched off. So there's just nothing happening in this digestion system. The absorption mechanism gets shut down. The body may want to eject the content. So again, if your body suddenly goes, <gasps> bear attack, it wants to make you light and ready to respond. And if you've recently eaten something and it say it's high up at, in the stomach level, remember food, you know, hangs around being processed in the stomach for about four hours before it passes into the next stage of digestion. So if you've got food higher up in your system and you go into this sympathetic dominant response, then often you might want to eject that upwards. So that's why a lot of people do, you know, feel the need to, to vomit or do actually vomit when they are nervous and anxious. So we have quite a few performers who, um, you know, literally throw up before they go on stage. And again, that's going to bring a lot of uh, stomach acids and things up into the vocal tract. So if you're a performer who's using your voice, that's not going to be um, a very useful way to be beginning your performance. But also if you've got food lower down in the system, so food that's further down in the uh, contestants in the, or in the colon, um, then often you might want to run to the bathroom uh, to express that, um, that substance in another way, right? So again, that kind of upset stomach having to, you know, can't get off the, the, the toilet before your performance is, is quite another um, common experience for people and that sort of irritable bowel um, uh, type uh, response. 
if sometimes the food, if it's kind of around middling, the body won't eject it, or some people just don't have that kind of response. But because everything shuts down, all the, the processing of, of, of the, the, the food breaks down or shuts down, any food that's left in the digestive tract starts to ferment because it's just like, you know, if you leave food anywhere and, and just, you know, don't do anything with it, it's going to start to ferment and rot and stagnate and it's going to start releasing gases. And so this is what can lead to bloating, sort of abdominal distension and just this digestive discomfort. So a lot of people, you know, they don't necessarily have the sort of uh, issue of having to run to the bathroom but they're like every time I eat I just feel bloated and I feel you know uncomfortable um, and so this is why because essentially um, you know I, I have so many people that will will come and you know everybody these days is getting really good about their diets right they're like I eat everything organic I don't eat any gluten I don't eat sugars I just you know it's like the best diet on the planet but I still have digestive problems right because whatever you're putting in to the body if you're not a breaking it down because the gastric juices the saliva nothing's online and b you're not um absorbing it then i always say you know whatever beautiful food you've put into your gut becomes very expensive gut compost at that point um so um there's another issue that that plays into um this gut um uh, situation. So a lot of people who have sort of chronic digestive issues, the irritable bowel symptoms, um, have essentially got leaky gut, right? So this increased intestinal permeability, as we talked about, the lining of that gut is, is a, um, uh, a defense mechanism, right? It's um, part of the, the sort of uh, the little gatekeepers there that decide what's what, what's allowed in what gets kept out and we have these little things called gap junctions um, as you probably know in in the gut where the the, the epithelial cells meet um, and what what uh, studies have also shown i've got this this um, uh, reference there but there are many studies that show this is that when you are in stress state so one of the things that gets released is uh, corticotropin releasing hormone so that's the hormone that's released in the brain that sends the signal to the um, adrenal cortex to, to re produce cortisol um, so when we're stressed that's coming into the system what's also been found is that's been linked to gut permeability so the increase in these gap junctions um, and also an increase in mast cell production so again this is this inflammatory response so essentially you know i talked about in my um, other talk about the body tends to be either running the safe program or the unsafe program i'm i'm not under threat or i'm under threat um, and if we are under threat then uh, we're in the 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 stress response um, so we're going to um, become sort of hyper reactive and because the gut lining is part of that we can get this increased inflammation and mast cell production because we're going to attack and everything becomes a, a predator at that point even the food in our gut so we can start to get this inflammatory response to things that are in our gut and if we're getting um issues with with increased intestinal per permeability actually the defenses are starting to break down at this point so there's again you know this sounds contradictory sometimes because we said well absorption shuts down when we're in stress response and here we're looking at something that's increasing intestinal permeability but it really it's a very complex uh, system that that um, is far too detailed to fit into this talk um, but there's differences between acute states of stress and chronic states of stress um, and you know how long you're in the cortisol uh, dependent phase and 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 um, um, things like that because we can start getting into adrenal fatigue and, and then the, the the chemistry changes again um, but essentially some people will get this kind of shut down other people again I think particularly if they've been in this situation for a long time you're going to get this this kind of increased intestinal permeability stuff is passing through the gut wall that shouldn't and that is um, perhaps going to cause then 
in the circulating bloodstream close to those epithelial cells an inflammatory response to say you're not supposed to come in we've got to attack you so you basically got this kind of war raging down in that poor old uh, gut so just to look at the, the um, nervous system of the gut itself. So as you're probably uh, familiar, there is the enteric nervous system, which is the, um, the gut brain, as it's known, because it's actually the only part of the body that can operate if it is uh, disconnected from the, the upper brain, right? Um, so the connection from the enteric nervous system the gut to the brain is via the vagus nerve so we have our right and left branch of the vagus nerve uh, coming down obviously vagus nerve as you know innervates multiple organs in the body um, and also uh, is the connection to the uh, to from the gut to the the brain and Obviously, the vagus nerve is also the parasympathetic supply. So this is key. So the vagus nerve tells the gut, we're good, everything's safe, you can go about your normal business. And then when we drift up into a, a more sympathetic dominant state, vagus nerve is going to get inhibited. And so it doesn't tell the gut it's safe. And that then uh, makes it um, more reactive to the sympathetic um, signaling in the body. But what we also know about the vagus nerve is that 80% of the fibers that run um, up and down the vagus nerve, 80% of those fibers are going from the gut to the brain. Only 20% go, goes the other way. So I always say, who's really in charge, right? The gut knows best. And, um, you know, this comes down to the kind of colloquialisms that, oh, my, I had a gut instinct about it. You know, I felt that in my gut. Well, that's actually a biological reality. Um, so when we're, again, it comes down to that, are we safe? Are we unsafe? Often the, the gut will be detecting lack of safety before we cognitively uh, realized it. And it's often the gut that is telling the brain that we've got a problem. And that's what we're going to, to explore a little bit more here. So the gut, in, gut instincts are usually right. Um, so let's look at the sort of relationship now between food and mood. So we've looked at how being in a stressed state, so if you're anxious about something, it's going to affect the operation of the gut, but also the food we actually eat can affect uh, our mood as well. And this is via the microbiome. So I'm sure you're familiar that our, um, uh, our gut is full of uh, um, bacteria and these form what's known as the microbiome and they're part of what helps us to break down our food um, and uh, keep all systems operational in the gut. Now when we um, uh, eat inflammatory foods for instance, highly processed foods, things that we know we shouldn't, very sugary foods, um, then it's going to affect the microbiome and can create more inflammation in the um, in the gut itself and essentially remember inflammation is part of this immune response so if you're putting some kind of um, you know essentially the the gut will consider any substance that comes in is this a food or is it a non-food and there's many things that people eat these days that are actually technically a non-food i.e the body either doesn't have the ability to break it down or the components of it are not useful for either growth and repair or energy production. That's really what we're using um, our food particles for. So if the, if the uh, gut bacteria or the lining of the gut look at this and go, I can't do anything with that, it's considered a threat and it's going to attack it. So we get an inflammatory response. So again, going back to the safe, unsafe mode, if we're putting stuff into the system that the body doesn't know what to do with, it's going to say this is unsafe and it's going to attack it. The, um, uh, the increased inflammation that's coming from, from the gut bacteria is going to signal to the brain via both the bloodstream and the nervous system, we're not safe, we've got a problem. What that's going to do 
is drive, okay, we're not safe, we need to run the unsafe program, sympathetic dominance state, and we start running that via the um, HPA axis, hypothalamus pituitary axis, right, uh, which drives the, the sympathetic response. So the state in the gut of inflammation versus not inflamed, i.e. safe versus unsafe, dictates how we're going to respond emotionally as well, because the body's just going, we've got a problem, you know, it's Houston, we've got a problem. So the NASA control at Houston are gonna say, right, well, let's put the defense system on, online, which then is gonna take your gut offline, right? As we've just seen. And so we get ourselves into this really nasty loop. So this is known as the gut brain access, axis. Um, so stress and poor diet, as we've seen, either or, or a combination of the two, because again, it's, you know, one of those things when we're feeling emotionally low and stressed, we tend to get drawn towards those comfort foods, which are often sugary foods. And that kind of goes to that um, dopamine issue. If you've already watched my other talk, I was talking there a lot about dopamine regulation or dysregulation or dopamine hunger, which can be a feature of, of being a creative individual um, and uh, so if we're dopamine hungry we're wanting comfort reward remember dopamine gives us that reward sensation we might look for that in the foods that we're eating right which is normally going to draw us towards those sugary foods which are going to drive inflammation so that's in the mix when when we're either stressed or eating inflammatory foods and or both it's going to alter the microbiome and this is known as dysbiosis when we get this imbalance in the beautiful normally beautifully balanced architecture of the the gut bacteria and the gut flora so dysbiosis is then going to drive anxiety and depression so there's a lot of research that shows that um, that uh, gut dysbiosis can cause both anxiety and depression via this gut brain axis um, it's also going to lead potentially to irritable bowel symptoms, as we've talked about, that could manifest as either constipation or diarrhea or a combination of the two, abdominal bloating, digestive discomfort. That in itself is stressful when every time you eat, you start to get problems. And, you know, if you're somebody who has that tendency to need to always run to the bathroom and you're about to go on stage, that's very stressful. Um, so then we're stressed, guess what? That leads to gut inflammation. So you can see how people can get stuck in this loop of, um, of this stress cycle, which is driving gut dysbiosis, driving irritable bowel, and therefore re-driving the anxiety. So I always say it's not just what you eat that's important, because obviously it is important what you eat but it's how you eat it. It is the emotional context in which you eat. Because as I say, I have people coming to me saying, I eat the best diet, I eat it's all kale and spinach and lovely green stuff and I don't eat any rubbish, but I still have digestive problems. And I say, well, if you're eating when you're in a sympathetic dominant state, and that doesn't have to mean that you're sitting there anxious when you're eating, it can just be, you know, you're thinking about, oh, I've got to do that tomorrow, and I haven't done that, and I did and the worst thing I always say is don't, do not be watching the news and checking your emails and have your phone anywhere near you when you are eating your meal. It needs to be a sacred space where you can bring online the parasympathetic system. You have to be in a parasympathetic dominant state in order to receive the food, right? You cannot be in this uh, sympathetic dominant space where your body is just going to reject the food um, and it's going to potentially stagnate in your system and cause bloating, discomfort and all the issues we've already talked about. So sacred space for eating. So this is my usual little um, slide I show to my artists about this. Avoid your inflammatory foods. So I you know, talk them through all of that eat in calm surroundings. So for instance, I was working with, uh, I live in Los Angeles here and I work with a lot of industry people here and obviously we've got the big film industry and I was working with an actress who was um, uh, in a, a, a um, well-known uh, TV series and she said, 
everybody on that set drives me mad. <laughs> you know, if, you, if you've never worked on a film or TV set, they do like 16, 17 hour days. They get there at four or five in the morning. They have to be in makeup and then they're there until the last thing. And so they're all kind of stressed out, strung out, lacking sleep. And we've got a lot of the artistic temperaments in there, which again, if you haven't seen my other talk um, yet, I get into that um, a bit in that. And, you know, it's not an easy place to navigate and, um, and you're just forced around these people all the time. And she just said, I just got the, I've just got the most terrible, you know, gut discomfort all the time. And every time I eat anything, I, I'm in trouble, you know, to the point that I almost, almost don't want to eat all day. But then I start, you know, feeling faint and I, I, I can't do my job. Um, and she said, but everybody drives me mad. And when I explained to her the mechanism that you need to be in a parasympathetic state to receive the food and to, to actually and to not give yourself the digestive discomfort, um, I said, do you, do you sit and eat with all, all these people? She said, yeah. And then everybody's talking about all these things and it's just like, it really triggers me. And I said, well, the simplest thing is you take your food somewhere else. You do not eat around these people. If they're going to trigger you into a stress state, remove yourself. So that's what she did. And the next week she came back, she said, it's just like a miracle. So it's an absolute miracle. I just eat quietly in my own space, no distractions. They're not around me. And my digestive problems are, are so much better. So it's really important to look at the environment in which you're eating. Allow time to digest. And we're going to get in in a moment to uh, the performer's lifestyle and throwing food down and running is often, you know, or throwing food down and running on stage is, is often um, a feature of the performer's lifestyle. But we, it's not just the time of eating. It's also the time to digest it afterwards. Um, so we need to give ourselves a bit of calm, um, non-stimulated um, state to be in after we've eaten as well. So we really need to honour that, that, um, that time. And sometimes with some artists, you know, I'm always the ones that get really bad symptoms. It's, it's almost better, you know, not to eat on the run if that's your only choice. If you've only got 10 minutes, then let's look at giving you a, you know, a better breakfast before you start the day, you know, and try not to put that food in at right at that time. So timing of food is a, is a thing we'll get into. Use breathing techniques. So we're going to talk about that towards the end. What are some strategies that we can use? And breath is just works on so many levels to, to manage the digestive system. And then avoid eating late at night. So this is an issue for our uh, performers because that's the performer's lifestyle, right? Late night eating. So we're going to talk about uh, scheduling of, of food. So, um, so daily schedules, I mean, it, it, it really depends on the type of performer, the, the world that they live in. And, and also, you know, that may change with different shows or product productions that they're doing. Uh, but if you're looking, say, for instance, at a classical ballet dancer uh, who's with a company, they're, you know, eating is just, there's, it's just not factored into the day at all. You know, they're normally doing class, their morning class at about 9.30 uh, for an hour and a half. And then they go straight into rehearsals and rehearsals run all day up until around six or something, at which time they stop and then they have to go put their makeup on um, and get ready for a 7.30 show. You know, and so they're literally like, oh, I've just got to run to the, the cafeteria and grab some, some food. And rehearsal schedules are often you're used for some of it and not for other bits of it. So they might have a break where they can go and grab something. But there's really not a lot of time built in for, for honouring um, the fact that people need to feed themselves um, and have time to digest it. So um, that can be a real issue. So they have to get quite creative about so if you can teach them the principles you know of what situation you need to be in to allow your digestive system to work what, what sort of foods are going to work for you and it's a very you know um, individual thing as well so perhaps working with a nutritionist as well to, to figure out what this individual needs um, it can be helpful but the one thing that really affects most performers across the board, or well, most sort of uh, people in live performance who are performing in the evening, um, is timing of food. Um, so, you know, I worked for years in, in, um, in West End London uh, musical theatre and 
you know, you've got a 7.30 show every night. Some days you have two shows, right, the matinee in the evening. Um, you don't want to obviously be eating right before you perform because you, it's going to be very uncomfortable and, and um, uh, not uh, um, the, the most conducive to doing a good performance. So, you know, you want to eat something earlier in the day, have time to digest it. But then when you finish the show, because it's high performance and you've used a lot of energy, then you're starving, right? So you've come off stage at like 10.30 or something. And by the time you get out of the theatre, it's about 11 o'clock. And then you're like, oh, I'm starving now. And so we always used to go out for the, you know, London, the theatre scene there is full of all these, you know, late night performers restaurants that were catered to all the performers who come off stage at that. So it's a very social thing as well. And they're often like curries and, you know, really not the healthiest foods at all. Um, so you'd often go and then have a meal at like 11, 11.30 at night. And then, uh, then you're going to bed uh, not long after that because then you're really tired. And, you know, the standard uh, thing is that you really need sort of a good four hours between finishing your last meal of the evening and going to bed. Because if you've got, remember, the food stays in the stomach for up to four hours. Um, the stomach is uh, filled with lovely stuff like hydrochloric acid and, and stuff that's designed, you know, the lining of the stomach is designed to handle that. The lining of the esophagus above it is not. Um, and so there is an issue um, of acid reflux, or gastroesophageal reflux disease, GERD is the, is the sort of technical term for it, often referred to as a hiatus or hiatal hernia. So if you are eating late at night, and then um, going to sleep when you've still got food in the stomach, essentially because then you're, you're sort of lying supine, you're not upright anymore, you can get sort of washing of acid up onto the, the, the sphincter at the top of the uh, stomach there between the esophagus and the stomach. And if, if it gets irritated by this acid, it can spasm, and then you're getting reflux of stomach acid up into um, the esophagus and it kind of aerosolizes uh, and comes up the tube and it can actually coat um, vocal cords so this is a big issue for singers and actors people who are using their voice in performance um, acid reflux is a very very common issue um, and it's typically because they're eating late at night going lying down too soon getting refluxing um, and it's also linked to stress as well so if they happen to be a stressed individual as well they're going to be more prone to this so they can start to be getting you know laryngeal uh, soreness and you know just the whole vocal tract starts to become inflamed because it's getting um, coated with aerosolized acid which is clearly not the best um, substance to be lining your your not only your your esophagus but it's once it's come up to the top it can aerosolize out into the sort of the vocal tract and you can get backfall of it down onto to vocal cords um so very very common and then they're piling on all their antacids and things which you know we know are not not the best things that you should be living on either um so we really need to be looking at the timing of meals the stress state and the emotional context in which they are eating um, as well uh, to address that. And then other issues uh, for performers, touring schedules, right? They're, um, uh, particularly if they are, you know, a lot of the big uh, ballet companies and orchestras are in touring internationally. So they're on planes a lot of the time. Um, and um, as we know, any, any form of transport, but particularly uh, plane travel is very dehydrating. So they can get, uh, you know, very dehydrated um, uh, on those uh, trips. Traveling across time zones, we know how that messes with the body clock and messes with your eating schedule. Um, so it's really having, to, you know, you have to preempt it. You have to really sort of build in um, the, the eating uh, kind of uh, schedule for for performers and try and help them navigate across time zones and say well maybe you're going to stick to you know if you only because often they'll be like in a venue for two days and then they're moving on again um, so maybe sort of sticking to 
pick a time zone and stick with that as much as you can and don't change to that time zone if you're going to be moving out of it again it's a complex thing that you need to kind of work out for them on a on a, 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 a kind of case by case basis um, and you know what are they taking with them on tour so you know i've had some artists particularly sort of music artists who are, are touring a lot of the time um, they'll tour their own steamer and juicer you know because they're turning up in venues and and where do they get their food there's only some you know not so healthy food store in this town they don't have a nice organic market or anything um or um you know you tend to be eating out all the time when you're on tour because you 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 don't have a kitchen necessarily if you're staying in a hotel um and so you know restaurant food again is not always the most uh, healthy choice and if you're on a budget you might not have the budget to go to somewhere that's going to give you better ingredients than than the fast food joint right um so i have some artists as i say that will tour with a steamer and a blender or something so that they can actually um cater for themselves um in their hotel room and not kind of get pulled into um the the, the bad habits of um of whatever sort of restaurants and things might be available to them in a particular venue so again planning ahead knowing what works for you you know in the sports world they've got this down they you know if you're an athlete your you know your whole nutrition thing is prescribed out for you and it's all kind of you know managed and we just don't typically uh, tend to do that in the arts profession so it's something that's that's really key to, to um, address and then I, I talked a little bit about um, breath being so important for um, for digestive health and uh, if we look here with the diaphragm I'm sure you're all familiar with this beautiful dome shaped muscle that's uh, that separates the chest cavity from the abdominal cavity and obviously beneath that we have all the digestive organs um, so the motion of the diaphragm is actually a fundamental part of digestion because yes we have intestinal motility right the the uh, spasmodic squeezing muscular mechanism that, that helps to push the th food through the digestive tract bear in mind as well that gets switched off when we go into sympathetic mode so nothing's moving um the but that's actually quite a weak mechanism it doesn't it doesn't have a lot of power behind it so what helps with that motility the movement of the of the the food substances through the through the gut uh is helped by the motion of the diaphragm so as the diaphragm as we breathe in the diaphragm flattens downwards and it has a massaging effect on the digestive organs and then the recoil that helps with the passage of food through the, through the tube. If we're in stress state, right, we are going to be in that high chest breathing as we saw, it tends to send us into upper chest breathing and therefore the motion of the diaphragm becomes limited. So it's only when we're taking really deep breaths that we're getting the full aid of the diaphragm in the digestive process. What's also key about diaphragm movement is that it's very um, key in um, activating parasympathetic nervous system and the vagus nerve in particular. So the full motion of the diaphragm uh, helps to uh, bring vagus nerve online and induce the parasympathetic state. So we really need to be looking at breathing patterns to help um, with the digestive process um, and again people who kind of sit collapsed when they're eating they're going to be limiting the motion of the diaphragm so um, it's what we need to be uh, thinking of and we also need to think about how breath helps the immune system as well um, the diaphragm is the major pump of that lymphatic system right the drainage system of the body when we have that full motion of the diaphragm we're helping to really bring the air down into the base of the lungs so that the residual air in there is being exchanged i always say if you're only breathing sh in a shallow way the air at the bottom of the lungs is kind of becoming stagnant and it's more like a stagnant pond than a nice babbling brook we need to house clean right and bring that air all the way down as we've talked about, it brings the vagus nerve online, gets in, us into the parasympathetic state, 
um, which is when the immune system gets switched back on. Remember, it's switched off when we're in sympathetic dominant state. And of course, it's going to increase oxygenation um, in the uh, body, and that's going to help with um, inflammatory conditions, you know, um, reactive oxygen species and things like that, which can be an issue with, with digestive uh, health and less conducive to adverse bacterial growth. So again, part of when we're well oxygenated, our gut bacteria are going to be uh, in a healthier balance. So breath and anxiety, right, the, the shallow breathing pattern that goes with, with this sympathetic dominant state, reduced oxygenation, increased heart rate. Uh, when we go into um, deep breathing, we're going to lower that heart rate. So when you have um, uh, when if, if you are breathing in a shallow manner and you've got reduced oxygenation and you're still active, right, you're performing whatever you're doing, your muscles are demanding oxygen. If, there's, if your system's less oxygenated, it has to drive the heart rate even more to get what it has got around more quickly, right? So if we're using deep breath, you've got more oxygen in the system, the heart rate can come down because it doesn't have to work so hard to, to move the, the, the small amounts around. So that's going to bring us into that parasympathetic state. So I really, um, you know, recommend breath work just for sort of general health and anxiety management but actually to actively use it before you eat so that you prepare the body for the digestion that's just a little overview of everything we just talked about about the benefits of of good uh breath work so we need to be looking at different ways of using the breath so if we're looking at um using the breath as a form of relaxation technique um, for uh, preparing for eating or um, preparing for sleeping as well. So something where we want to be in that very chilled out state, then this is a good um, little sequence that we go through. Um, but it's not really conducive to performance. So we'll talk about that in a moment. But as we've said, you know, we tend to go into this high chest breathing pattern when we're stressed. So we really want to focus lower down and actually use abdominal breathing. So allowing the abdomen to expand as we take a breath in. Now, this, particularly if you're working with dancers, is a big problem <laughs> because dancers are trained to suck their bellies in right if you've ever done a ballet class probably the first thing that you were told when you were a little tiny kid as you went in put your stomach in put your stomach in you know so dancers suck their abs in which automatically sends them to a high chest breathing and that abdomen just stays locked in all the time it's like a pavlovian conditioning i literally still today even if i'm going in because i still teach ballet and I still perform occasionally. As soon as I step into a studio or step onto a stage, my stomach literally goes in and up, my abs go in, and then I now consciously override it because I know I don't need to be doing that. We don't really want to be doing that even in a ballet class. That's a whole other lecture. Um, but uh, essentially, if, if the abs are held, and it's not only our ballet dancers, but it's also a um, protective response when we're anxious. So remember, when we're anxious, we're expecting... A, a physical attack or the body is expecting a, a physical attack and you know our, our abdomen is kind of the biggest vulnerable area because most of parts of our body have a kind of bony cage around them the abdomen is very exposed and we could be open for a, a gut punch literally so people tend to brace their abdominal muscles when they're stressed so al allowing that to release is absolutely key because you can imagine when you're pulling your abdominal muscles in, you're increasing intra-abdominal pressure and that's going to be pressuring into the, the gut and this is not healthy for our gut. So training people to breathe and allowing their abdomen to expand is key. So we saw that diaphragm that's sitting over the top of all the organs. We want that diaphragm to come all the way down. In order for that to happen, the organs have to get out of the way. So you can actually try this. If you suck your belly button to your spine in ballet mode and pull that stomach in and try and take a really deep breath in, you're going to meet a lot of resistance, right? Because the abs are pushing the organs in and the diaphragm can't, can't descend fully. When we release the abdomen and now take a nice breath in and allow the abdomen to expand, 
you feel you've got that lovely elastic quality to the breath and you can take a much deeper breath because there's no resistance. So this is a key thing that we need to be in a place where we can release the abdomen for breath. You cannot be eating with your abs locked in, which so many dancers do. Um, one thing to be mindful of if you're teaching this to, to, to people, and I always like to be accurate with the anatomy because I have a lot of, you know, because this is also a good technique for singers, which is the technique they should be using as breath control for singers. And they often say, I'm filling my abdomen with air. I was like, yes, no, that would require a trip to the ER. There's no air going into the abdomen. The air stays in the lungs. We're allowing the organs to get out of the way of the motion of the diaphragm. So once they've trained themselves to release that abdomen with the in-breath, um, they're going to do some controlled breath work. And what you want to encourage is the exhale to be twice as long as the inhale. So if you've got somebody who's not used to deep, breathing uh, work, then just breathing in for the count of two and out for the count of four can be absolutely fine. When we take a breath in, we get a little bit of a spike of the sympathetic system. So remember, this is a dynamic dance, the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. Every in-breath is a little bit of increased sympathetic, heart rate goes up a little bit. Every out-breath, every exhale is parasympathetic dominant. So if we make our out breath twice as long as the in breath, you're getting, you're pulling yourself down into that parasympathetic state. So in for two, out for four, in for three, out for six, you can go up, up the scale as people get more practiced at it. You just want to be mindful that they're not getting, you know, a little lightheaded if they're not used to this breath work. So in for two and out for four is fine for kind of beginner level making sure that nothing's going on here. So I have them put one hand on their abdomen, one hand on their chest. And it's like, I want your hand on, on your abdomen to move, but the hand on the chest is not going to move with the breath, with the in-breath. So they can learn to place that breath a lot lower. And then they can use this uh, before eating and before sleeping and when they're stressed out. So I often say, if you're preparing food, be doing the breath work as you prepare the food. It really slows you down and you start to really engage with your ingredients and, you know, be in gratitude for the food you're about to eat and receive. You know, a state of gratitude is a state of openness. And, you know, if we go back to the times when I was a kid at school, we all had to say grace before the meal. If you take away the religious connotations, what were we doing? we were in receiving mode, we were in gratitude, that's a parasympathetic state. So we were actually preparing our system to receive. So if you can do that as you're preparing the food, it really engages you with the process. And then as you sit before you take that first mouthful, do some breaths, make sure your body is in a state that's ready to receive and then make sure that they're chewing at least 20 times, they say, you've got to chew each mouthful so that the digestive juices in the mouth have done their job and you're not sending undigested food further down the system. So while that's great for before eating, before sleeping, as a stress reduction technique, it's not ideal before practice or performance when you need to be alert. So there's a difference between being relaxed and chilled out and actually being alert and online. So when you're going into either, you know, practice training or into performance, you don't want to be like super chilled out because that's just not, that's not going to work for you, right? You need to be on your game. So again, it's about where you are on that spectrum. We want to be alert. We want to be prepared and ready, but we don't want to be stressed, right? So there's a different technique. Um, and this is called... Um, the coherence technique. So it's, some of you may be familiar with um, the HeartMath Institute. I'm actually a HeartMath certified practitioner. So this is a system where we can measure heart rate variability, which as you're probably familiar with, with is, a, is, a, is a vector of, of health, how um, elastic your heart rate variability is. But we also look at the quality of that variability. Have people got a very kind of incoherent you know very spiky line that comes out on heart rate variability versus this lovely sine wave that tells us we're in a state of coherence so really when we're going into performance or if you want to be you know on your game in practice in the studio then you want to be coherent rather than chilled out so 
similar kind of techniques. We still want to be um, allowing the softening of the abdomen for the breath. But actually, this technique is a great one for just getting yourself into that really clear, um, alert, but not stressed state. And it's actually to focus on breathing into the heart so that you're actually pulling the breath straight into the heart, not to be confused with the upper chest and shoulders, but just the image. So what I often say to avoid people getting into sort of, I'm breathing into my heart, is just say, imagine you've got nostrils right over your heart in your chest. And as you breathe in, you're just pulling the air straight into the heart. And so that it's, it's flowing in and out. And the suggestion for this is actually to have an equal in and out breath so that we're not dropping too much into that parasympathetic state. So in for five seconds and out for five seconds is a, is a good average because if you do six cycles of that, it's a minute. Um, but if that's too long for people, they could do three and three, you know, whatever, but just make them equal. And then as you're um, doing this, um, then you want to really bring in, as you breathe in, a, a regenerative feeling. So, so something like gratitude, again, appreciation, care for something, or just saying, oh, I'm really pleased that this happened in my life. So some kind of reinforcing, renewing uh, kind of emotion as you breathe in. So I normally say six cycles of that. If I've got them doing the five second in or out, it's a minute. So, so it's a minute before you go on stage or before you even put your makeup on or whatever point that is in your performance preparation that you want to put this into the system. And it's so easy to do that you can be doing this standing in the wings and nobody knows you're doing it. You're just getting yourself into that coherent state and then you're alert and ready. So really recognizing the difference between getting into a state of relaxation and getting into a state of coherence for performance. So I hope that's been uh, interesting for you and, and you know, really looking at how the emotional state really dictates the digestion, but also how the digestion itself affects emotional state. It really is uh, an intricate loop. And so when you're working with people, you've got to find a way to come in and break that cycle. So addressing diet is, of course, important. But the piece that so many people miss is the emotional context in which they are eating. So helping them to address that, to recognize that and build that into um, their in working environment, their home environment, whatever it may be, that they really treat the, the, their mealtimes as sacred space um, can, can really turn, turn the corner for a lot of people who suffer with digestive uh, issues. So managing the stress helps the digestion, managing the digestion helps the stress. So whichever way you have an entry point into this, it can really help uh, create a much more uh, renewing uh, cyclical balance uh, for, for our performing artists. So thank you for listening and I look forward to the Q&A with you, which I think we're doing early in the new year. So please scribble down some questions and I'd be very happy to explore any of this in more detail with you uh, when we meet. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs>